Like a backstage pass to the world of fly fishing travel, this is Waypoints, the podcast of destination angling. News and events, helpful travel tips, destination profiles, great stories, and expert advice from some of the most seasoned and experienced names in fishing travel. Waypoints is brought to you by Yellow Dog Fly Fishing Adventures, the industry's number one specialty travel company for the very best insider knowledge, logistical support, and trip preparation. Freshwater or saltwater, international or domestic, Yellow Dog has you covered for your next fishing adventure. And now, your Waypoints host, Yellow Dog founder and director, Jim Klug. I'm joined today by Kristen Mustad, the founder and owner of Nautilus Reels. Nautilus is a Florida-based company with a very simple and direct stated goal, to make the world's best fly reel. Fly reels are obviously an integral part of any angler's kit, and they play an incredibly important role when it comes to success in destination angling, especially when chasing large, strong, or exotic fish that demand the most from our gear and equipment. To tackle the topic of fly reels, I wanted to talk with an individual who not only understands high-end machining and innovative design, but someone who's also an accomplished and worldly angler, an expert who can discuss relevant technologies and design while also applying this information to actual on-the-water scenarios. Kristen Mustad from Nautilus Reels, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's been a long time coming. You know, you and I have both worked in the industry a long time. We've been around for a lot of years and we, we've known each other and we've kind of occasionally crossed paths and talked from time to time. But for whatever reason, we've never really hung out or had the chance to fish together or, or go out on a trip together. That's right. We've never fished together. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you took the time to sit down with us today. Uh, and I got to tell you, I've always been super impressed by the Nautilus brand and the reputation that you guys have built in the fly fishing world. And I'm excited to pick your brain a little bit here and, uh, and tap into your knowledge for our listeners. Shoot. I'd love to love to tell you whatever you want to hear. So. <laughs> well, if you will share with our listeners a, a little of your kind of general background, where you grew up, the family name and the world of fishing and, and how you got your start as an angler. So I was uh, uh, born in Norway to a Norwegian father and a Spanish mother. And my dad was a consultant, so we travel around Europe a lot and on different jobs. And I moved from country to country at a very young age. And then once we got to high school, uh, we ended up getting uh, sent to boarding school. And great, greatest years of my life, by the way. Boarding school is great. It's not for everyone, but it was great for me. And, um, but fishing really, it started really early on. I remember up in Norway, we'd spend every summer in Norway, no matter where we lived. And I remember probably my first memory of it. And I know I've, I've fished before then, but my first memory of, you know, picking up a fly rod was up in the mountains in Norway. And we'd go out on this little wooden rowboat and pull, uh, sinking lines and, and, and troll fly rods, these, you know, fiberglass, orange fiberglass fly rods and fish for trout and take them home and salt and pepper, a little butter. And it was <laughs> breakfast, dinner, and lunch. So that was, uh, I must have been five years old then. So the Mustad name in fishing, obviously it, it's a name you probably get asked about a lot because it's a known name, pretty famous name in yep. fishing. What's the connection there? So my grandfather was the last uh, in my direct line that was the president for Mustad Hooks. And he passed away in 73 and that whole company got split up and that company had real estate and foods and stuff like that. And, and I ended up in, in the, in the arm that had nothing to do with uh, the fishing part. And my dad, his whole life had a passion to, you know, man, we should get that fish hook back and uh, whatever. Nothing ever came of that, but I always sort of knew uh, even in my young age that I wanted to really do something with fishing. So I got lucky enough that the opportunity came about and just the way things are and love that I did this. And yeah, maybe I could be making more money in another industry, but I don't think I'll, I'll ever be as happy as I am in this one, however small. Well, how'd you first find your way to kind of the world of machining? You know, what was the, the genesis of the Nautilus Reels idea? And at, at what point did you decide that you were going to make a career out of manufacturing high-end fly reels? So it's a pretty funny story. I had a little uh, tech company. So I would uh, bring Scandinavian technology companies, so Finland, Norway, and, and Sweden uh, mostly. And 
um, they had, whether it was uh, a software or hardware or even lines of code that would accelerate, you know, transfer of signals for cell phone companies, stuff like that. And I got an investor partner who ended up being not the ideal partner. So I'm always a little, you know, wary of partnerships, but uh, uh, ended up selling it back to him. And I stayed there for six or selling the rest of it to them. And I stayed there for six months. And on the last day, uh, on the last week, uh, my buddy said, hey, did you see the, uh, one of the guys that worked at the at, at the company said, hey, man, did you see uh, the article in the Miami Herald in the fishing section about that big dolphin they caught? And I said, fishing section in the Miami Herald? There's no fishing section. He goes, yeah, Thursdays, the sports section has a one page on fishing. And I said, no, I haven't seen that. So this is Wednesday. Thursday comes, I go into the printer room and all that, pick up the Herald, open up the fishing page, and there's an article about this guy that owns a fly reel company, and he's going fishing with a reporter. And I read the article, I said, wow, they had a bad day. And But but what really struck me was um, it, it sounded like the guy was tired of what he was doing. And so I said, man, I'm going to shoot him an email. So I shot him an email, and an hour later, I got a phone call. And then I went up to visit him. And that must have been like in October or something. And May, the following year, on May 23rd, um, I partnered with the guy. And then a year later, I bought him out. He had a real brand called Old Florida Fly Reels. And I think it was about a month and a half in, I figured out the auditors didn't do all that good a job. And that there was no money to be made at the price points that he had. And I thought it was a great idea. It was like a poor man's Abel. Uh, and I said, man, this is not going to work out. So I was, it was either, you know, shit can the whole deal or reinvent. And so we came up with the name Nautilus and figured out the shell pattern in the, in the frame that that's become our logo. Uh, my sister-in-law actually did our logo for us and it's, you know, been a really great logo. And, um, uh, just reinvented a reel with no machining experience and just going out there and sort of making drawings. Go, hey, can you do this? It's like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, how about this? Yeah, you can do that. So we started working on that and came out with a sealed reel. In September, we showed up at uh, uh, the Fly Tackle Deal Show in Denver in 2003. And that year, we got our first client. And it's pretty funny because – um, our first big client, which was Kaufman Streamborn, which at the time was probably the biggest fly shop in the world. Oh, they were huge. Huge, yeah. beautiful catalog. I, really, what I like, and this is a sidetrack here, but the flies, every single fly was photographed and there was a little note on where to fish it and where you can't go without it and all that. It was really well done, really well done. Yeah, they were, they were legendary. Legendary. In their day. And so, but in college here in the States. So I came to the States for college, but we can touch on that in a minute if you want to know more about that. But so I, in, in college, I used to buy my fly tying stuff from Kaufman's and I developed a friendship on the phone with Jerry Swanson and my dad needed fly fishing stuff. And he called me up. He goes, Hey, can you call your guy? And call Jerry and he'd ship it over to Europe. And, and so, um, when I, went into this deal before I went into this deal, I called up Jerry and I said, Hey Jerry, I'm thinking about buying this company. And he goes, Kristen, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need another reel out here. Don't do it. And I did it. And he, they showed up at the trade show uh, with Lance uh, Kaufman and, and Jerry Swanson and Joe LaFollette who did, today owns uh, a Royal treatment fly shop. Yeah, in Portland. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they all showed up and they looked at the Nautilus CCF, which was our first reel eight, eight, 10 and 12 weights and looked at it and said, man, I think you got something. And they really rode the wave. And I think it was amazing because, so our reel was 400 bucks for the eight weight. And, and we had so little time. I said, okay, man, I need to develop a reel. I need to know what price to sell it at and see if I can make it at that price. And so I figured, okay, biggest guys out there right now, it's Ross. And I found the Ross Big Game reel, and it was four hundred dollars for the eight weight. And I said, "Okay, we got to make a reel for four hundred bucks," and went to the drawing board with that in mind to compete with the biggest guy at the price point. And 
Kaufman's, what they did was pretty amazing. They, they'd get a guy that comes in and wanted a T-Bore or an Able for 600 bucks, and they'd give an instructions to the staff, saying, so sell them a Nautilus. And why would you sell them a Nautilus? It's $200, you know, less than, a, than an Able or the T-Bore at the time. And he said, because, you know, it's a better reel, and, and, and uh, they're going to buy that Nautilus reel, and they're going to go back to the pack, to their buddies, and they're going to go, what's that? And, oh, that's a Nautilus. They told me it's the best reel out there. Well, guess what happened? All those buddies, they don't want to have anything that's not the best. So they all went back and started buying reels. These guys made uh, – we sold more to Kaufman's than we've ever sold to any other shop even since. I mean, it was big dollars. Well, they were a powerhouse back then. Powerhouse, yeah. powerhouse. But so I think it was their smart that you know helped us. You know, they figured out that they could sell to all these guys instead of sending them home with another T-Bore or something. It's like, oh, you got another one? Cool. No. What's that? Go back and buy. So that was that was pretty cool. But so we went there and we did real well. And and I remember like the second year or something, Jose Wehebe came into our booth and he was a T-Bore guy. And he came in and I was nervous because I said, man, this guy, big timer. And he took the reel and started torquing it. I mean, I was like, oh, my God, he's trying to break it. <laughs> and he didn't break it. He just said, pretty nice. And he walked away. But uh, I was like, man. But it took years. And I think the, 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 the good part for us was that we flew under the radar because nobody really paid attention to us. And because we were a small company. And, and uh, it got to the point where suddenly it's like, hey, you know, I get a call from a dealer, Kristen. The target's on your back. I got a call from this guy, and I got a call from that guy, and they're asking about you. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, and here you are, 19, almost 20 years later. 20. 20 that, next year, yeah. That's a, that's a great milestone for any small business. I mean, that's yeah. amazing. It really is. And I didn't know the, the connection with the old Florida. I, I remember those reels. You remember reels. those reels? Yeah. yeah. They, were they made in, like, Stewart or something like that? or No, they were made in Pembroke Pines, Florida. Okay, yep. yeah. But I didn't know that's where what you bought that company and turned it into yeah. Nautilus. Yeah. That's super cool. I had no idea. So they had four CNC machines. I actually still have one of them. I've rebuilt it for way too much money, so I don't even want to return that. But, yeah, one of them's still there. Well, and now fast forward almost 20 years later, you guys just moved into a new factory in 21? Yeah. That's pretty exciting. So an ass kicking is what it is. <laughs> a lot going on. Yeah. I so we moved it from Pembroke Pines in two thousand six. And I swore that I would burn down the shop before I moved it again. And uh, I moved it again. Seventy five yards. Yeah. That's all we moved, but I could have moved it anywhere. The only difference would have been the freight cost of the machines, but everything else is the same. <laughs> it's still it's just crazy. as much work. Oh, terrible. <laughs> well now hopefully you don't have to move for another few years. Yeah, that's, that's right. Good. Well, I, I want to ask you some technical questions about yeah. fly reels and particularly talk about the importance of finding the right reels for the traveling angler, how to pair a destination, a particular species or a unique fishery with the right setups. Because that's a question we get all the time from people, especially when they're had to do a new destination or, or chasing a species they've never fished with before. Let's say they've got their nine foot five weight that, you know, is what they learned on and it's their go-to trout rod. Well, all of a sudden they've discovered bone fishing or they're going to go chase peacock bass and it's not just um you know learning new techniques about those fish but you got to completely kit yourself out for a whole different world yeah so first off what what in your opinion and we can quantify this by saying obviously you have a brand that that you promote that's your company and so you have a lot of opinions but i'm curious what in your opinion defines a quality fly reel and there are so many different price points and options out there these days how does someone separate a high quality reel from something that that might look kind of cool or it's got kind of a cool design, but ultimately that reel is likely to fail when it really matters? You know, you've, yeah. got, you've got a lot of junk out there and then you've got quality stuff. How do people kind of differentiate and tell the difference? So I think the, the most important thing for, for the, the guy that travels once a year, many of the reels out there will do fine. I think it's when you take it two years later on your second trip that you're going to find out that maybe I should have spent another hundred bucks or looked at the other guy. Um, because that's when you're going to see failure. It's later because, you know, water gets in, it might rust and you don't notice that. And then when you get on the water, it's all over. I remember my, you know, I used to fish, um, able reels. And I remember going to Las Rocas. I was actually working in Venezuela and I'd go over on the weekends with a buddy and, Every time I went out there, I had to dunk the reel because it was going, because the cork with Neat's foot oil 
had dried out or the, 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 that needs for gets a little sticky. And so you'd have this little squeal. And it's not an able thing. It's just cork with needs for oil. That's what happens. And so I always remember that. It was just have to dunk the reel so it wouldn't stick and break tip it. But I think, you know, there's several, you know, good brands out there. Uh, I think there's, you know, four to be considered. And I think we're, you know, honestly, I think we're ahead of them all. And, you know, there's so much. I think we just think out of the box a little more. If you think about the bushings uh, that we have in our trout reels, for example. So a typical trout reel with bushings will have a steel shaft and a bronze bushing. And steel is heavy and bronze is heavier. And so when we did our trout reel, we said, okay, we can't do bronze because then we need to make steel and we want to seal our drag. We want to encase the whole thing. And that's a bigger case. I can't make it out of steel for a bushing to run on or for bearings to run on. They also have to run on steel. So I need to find bushings that, you know, are self-lubricating, that don't scratch up parts and that don't wear. And we went to the food industry and we found these super expensive bushings that other companies or one company had uh, discovered before us, but they didn't use it because they were so expensive. And we use those from the food industry. And there's just in the food industry, you can't have any wear and tear because it's going to contaminate the food. And so that's where we went for those parts. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's our thinking out of the box and willing, you know, that we're willing to try new stuff uh, that sets really sets us apart. Well, you know, I've I've always felt that when it comes to fly reels, um, there's there's two things I always tell myself. One is is you very much get what you pay for, and yep. especially when you take it into difficult environments like the salt, in uh, places where let's say you're off on a destination trip for a couple weeks, you have a problem with your reel or your fly line or your rod for that matter. Well, guess what. You're not going back at the end of the day and hitting the local fly shop or getting on Amazon and having something delivered the next yeah. day. I mean, you're yeah. you're stuck with what you brought. And so you really need to make sure it, it is quality and that it's not going to fail you in the most difficult situations. Yeah. And when you get into these crazy environments, that becomes a real factor, much more so than maybe being on a trout stream close to home or in a freshwater environment. I mean, you go out there and start chasing big animals and tough environments, and you're going to really find out what that reel is, is made of. Yeah. And and I think that that is so applicable to destination angling. Well, what are some of the things that a, a typical consumer, maybe someone who, you know, knows a little bit about fly reels, uh, they value good equipment, they're willing to spend some money on having the right gear. What are some of the things that consumer can focus on or look for when it comes to finding a, a true kind of high performance fly reel? What should be on their checklist when they're shopping? So I think uh, it, it, it first, if you're going in the salt, and that's I guess the majority of your travel is going to be to the salt, right? That's a big part uh, of it for sure. Alaska could be another one or, you know. Uh, jungle. Jungle, yeah. But like you said, it has to last at least for that trip. And uh, most reels probably will. Like I said, the second time they will not. But there's a lot that can go wrong uh, that you just can't control. And like I, I always say, you know, we make a truly sealed reel. And – the advantage to our reel, and the only guarantee on a sealed reel, and I say this over and over, the only guarantee of a sealed reel is that if water ever gets in, it will never make it back out. And our reels, for example, we have a guy that that uh, that called us one time, and he goes, hey, I want to buy a spare hob because I'm going to Seychelles, and I don't want this thing to mess up. And I said, I'm not going to sell you spare hob. We don't sell spare hobs, and I guarantee you'll be fine. He goes, what if I, you know, something goes on and I get water in there? I said, you can fish it for your entire trip. And you could probably fish it for another six months before anything happens. If water does get in, you will know because the sounds that it's going to make is awful, but it's not going to change your, your startup inertia. It's not going to change your drag. It'll be all good. It's not going to fail. It's not going to fail. And I think when you're out there looking for a reel, uh, there's several things. Weight on a reel is real important. Uh, if you're out there casting all the time and if you pull out an 8, 9, 10, 12-ounce reel, and you're casting that thing all day, and especially in places if you have to blind cast, which is probably the most gruesome experience you can have. But if you have to blind cast all day, you get worn out, and you have to consider that. So let's say you go into the Bahamas, and you're going to go bone fishing, and you're going to bring your eight weight, maybe even a nine because the wind might blow, right? 
on your eight and nine, you know, take your good reel, large arbor. You want fast line pickup. That's key. You want to pick up line as fast as you can. And a quarter inch in diameter gives you about an inch, depending on how big it is, but it'll start at about inch and a quarter to three inches per quarter inch of diameter in line pickup. And that's a big deal. In line retrieval when you're yes, reeling that's right. it in. Yeah. Yep, when you're reeling it in. And, uh, but the, the weight factor, you know, I'd always tell people, man, if you're bringing a seven weight, you know, don't necessarily go buy an NVG, you know, seven, eight, which is what I would put on a seven weight. Go with an XL Max, which is a trout rail, but it's built for salt. And a lot of people use it for salt, but it weighs 4.7 ounces. It weighs half of what your eight weight reels, you know, typically weighs. And you can go out there and it's a dream to, to fish with. So weight's a big factor. Uh, reliability, you know, the only people you can ask is friends that fish the different brands and uh, your guide. I think the guide really comes down to it. We did a T-shirt for this fishing guide event, and on the uh, we have a flamethrowing tarpon on the front, and it says, it's not uh, who you know, it's what you know. And on the back it says, listen to your guide. And I, I bet that was a popular shirt. Super. And we only gave it out to fishing guides at this one event. That was it. So it's a, uh, I've, I've always wanted to bring it back, but it's, it's so true. You know, the guide is really the one that's going to tell you, Hey, and I think, you know, within your price point, I mean, look at, look at that, uh, you know, the XL max, the XL max, I'm telling you not to buy a seven, eight that costs 670 bucks, get an XL max that costs 450 bucks. So it's really you know, you don't need more than that. It's got a great drag. It's got a good drag knob that you can grab. That's another one. You know, you want to have a, a, a drag that you can adjust. And most of the time, you're not going to need a lot of drag, but you want it to be consistent and smooth. Well, the other thing, too, and, and you just touched on it, is finding that right balance with the fly rod. And then, of course, you're going to put backing, you're going to put fly line on there. And so you really want to have that whole kit together. Then you pick it up and, and you feel how it balances in your hand. And if you have a super heavy reel, that's kind of like a boat anchor, it's actually going to change the whole dynamic of how that full system casts so, and how so, that fly line is presented. Yeah. So I always tell people, if you put a heavy reel on a, and it's a personal experience, actually, I'll tell the story now. It, we were out, we were, we had customers wanting to make, wanting us to make an NV in a 12 weight. It was called the NV1112 that we then turned into the G9 for line pickup. So it became a nine weight after that with less backing. But so the NVG1112, I said, man, at four, at four and a half inches, it's not going to, it's not going to work. And back in the day, four and a half inches was a big 12 weight reel. Now it's five. And uh, I remember being on a boat and I had my Nautilus 12T that weighed 12 ounces. It was two ounces less than my biggest competitor. And it was awesome, you know, big win there. And I'm casting a 12 weight at Tarpon on the West coast of Florida. And it got real slow. And I said, man, I'm going to try that NV1112. And it was six months since it had gone to market and people were loving it. And we were selling the crap out of it, but I just didn't believe that you wanted such a light reel because, you know, people typically say you need a heavy reel to balance that 12 weight line that shoots backwards at 60 miles per hour. And then you got to winch that thing forward, act as a lever. And I put the, uh, NV1112 on there that weighed eight and some ounces. And when I cast it, the 12 weight felt like a nine or a 10. And I was like, man. And I gave the rod to the guy to say, try this. And he goes, do you change rod? And I said, no. What is this? And he looks at the rod. He goes, is it 12 weight? And I said, dude, it's the real. And I didn't realize that. It made it so much better to cast. Changed the whole balance of everything. It changes the action on the rod. Yep. So if you take a, a, a fast action, a 10 weight, and you put a heavy reel on there, it's going to actually make it softer. It'll pull it more towards medium. It's just like overlining it, right? It sort of has that effect, and it just makes it a lot harder to cast. Well, you touched on one thing just a second ago as well, and it was probably one of the biggest reel innovations that kind of hit the industry back in the, the 90s, and that's when large arbor reels became the big thing with reel design. Prior yeah. to that, you talked a few minutes ago about Ross Reels. They were a huge company in the yeah. late 80s and 90s. Still around today, still a big company, but back then they were kind of the undisputed leader. Um, and 
they came out, and I want to say it was probably like 92, 93 with some of their early large Arbor models. And then Bauer came out with some large Arbor models and some of the others. But it became like all the rage. Everybody so, had to go with large Arbor. So, so the large Arbor story, Loop came up with a large Arbor. And they're still the king of large Arbor with their super big reels. And, um, but it's not always the first mover that wins. And John Bauer picked up on that large arbor and he won the race. I mean, John Bauer was a powerhouse back then. And he really, you know, he took it to the bank. And, uh, you know, we immediately got on it. But what I've noticed is East Coast, like smaller reels, West Coast, like bigger reels. And we'd have the CCF 12 that they were fishing on 10 weights. That was a four and a half inch reel, four and a quarter inch at the time. And... Uh, the 10, they were fishing it on eight-weight reels. On the East Coast, no, man, the eight was a big reel on an eight-weight. It was four inches. Like, oh, that's too big a reel. It's still four inches. But every time, people are going bigger and bigger because of all the advantage. But, yeah, that race, I think it was won by by uh, um, John Bauer. And, and then everybody sort of picked up on it. And then, you know, what came after that was the gel spun spool. So gel pump comes out. Braid. Oh, it's the rage. Everybody's going to have finger cutting braid on there. And today, there's a lot of great braid out there, and a lot of people use it. And I personally, um, I'll avoid braid when I can. But like on a bonefish flat, I'll use 20-pound backing because it's thinner, and it cuts through the water better. Well, that that's actually an interesting point. And that was one of the questions I was going to ask in a minute, but I'm glad you brought it up. And um, backing is a... Is I mean, there's so many options out there, right? Um, and there's new stuff coming out all the time. Um, that's a question we get a lot is what type of backing? Because obviously the, the type of backing that you put on is going to uh, greatly influence the capacity of backing you can have on there. You've got Dacra and you've got braided. You've got the gel spun. You've got some of the new stuff coming out of yeah. Asia right now. Four strand, eight strand. So many different options. Yeah. Um, is there like a definitive answer for a fly angler or, I mean, where do people start when it comes to backing on, on reels? So I say, unless you need capacity, and I'm, remind me to get it back on capacity. It's a cool story. Uh, unless you need the capacity, don't, uh, you know, don't go to braid. That's my, my deal. If you have, like, I've got a guide in, in Miami that does nighttime tarpon fishing, Russell Kleppinger, that guy, he puts on 200-pound braid on fly reels. So he wants a high capacity reel because he needs to put 200 pound braid. He's never going to run 200 yards because he's going to chase the fish down with a boat, but he needs it because that, that tarpon, if he catches it at night under a bridge, it's going to zigzag through the pilings. And that crazy guy actually clips a buoy on the rod and throws it in and <laughs> lets it come out the other side of the of the bridge and then picks it back up and keep fighting it. <laughs> but, but so that's for abrasion. So that's a big, important thing. Like if you're going to be fishing fish that are going to go over or into coral, go braid as, as you should go fluoro. I'm a Maxima guy. So I fish mono. I love mono and I'll go fluoro when it's abrasion tarpon, just the bite. But if I can get away with just green Maxima, that's where I'm going. But, uh, so yeah, the braid story is, is if you needed to cut through water, left and right running fish, it's good fish that run far and create a big belly Marlin, great. But tuna that runs straight down and they circle, you don't really need all that braid. But I'd put braid on for tuna anyway because you're in blue water. But uh, anything else, I have Dacron on all of mine. And the cool thing about Dacron, you can stack colors and it just adds to the look of your reels. We've been doing it for years and I love it. Just blood knot one to the next and it works fine. Yeah, that, that's a great indicator where you measure out the amount and then you have different colors for different lengths. So yep. as you're retrieving, you kind of have an idea of where you are. Yep. It's a pretty cool system. Yeah. So people colors. usually people will usually mark the, the the or have like the first 50 yards that they spool on. So it'll be the last 50 yards to get off your reel. They call it the oh shit color, right? And yeah. then above it's that, they'll red put it, right there. Yeah, and then they above <laughs> that they they put they put you know whatever some other color, right? I always say do the first 50 yards. Because it's going to show you how far your fish really runs. There you I go. challenge, always challenge people. I say you're not going to see the end of the fifty on most fish. Yeah, which takes me to 
capacity. So one day I'm having lunch with Chica Fernandez, uh, who's a legend in the sport. And Chico, I asked him, I said, Chico, what's the deal with 200 yards of backing, man? Why does anybody need 200 yards of backing? Everybody says 200 yards of backing. Nobody needs now, trout reels. I can't sell a five weight if it doesn't have 150, 150 yards of backing. Come on. And personally, I fish on my seven and, and half the time on my eight. I usually like my NVG eight, nine better on the eight because it picks up faster. But I'll fish my XLs and not the XL Max that holds more backing. I fish an XL, which is a six, seven reel spool. I fish that on an eight and I get 125 yards of backing. And I've gone for false albacore. And they run. I haven't run out of backing. The only place I run out of backing is in Iceland fishing on the lake. Because if that big trout takes, I actually fish an XL Max on a six there. And they will spool you because if they go out, they go out and just look. And then you're fishing a tiny little nymph and and 5X, you know, 4X if you're lucky. And you just... You're looking and okay, that last caller is already halfway done. You start cranking the drag and pop, it pops off. But yeah, so Chico, Chico's answer to the backing question was, Kristen, we were building mid-arbor reels with backing. So we're stacking on 50 yards of backing so we have something to retrieve on. And I'm sure you remember that from the standard arbor trout days where you could barely get a 555 Cortland, that peach yeah, colored line. a 90-foot fly line. 90-foot yeah. fly line and, and about 40 yards of backing. That's what fit, fit on that reel. And if the fish got on the backing, you were reeling in an inch at a time. And the last 30 feet of your fly line were, looked like a curly tail going out there because they were all curled up. And that's really, you know, the, the, the answer to this backing thing is you don't need 200 yards. 150 is fine. Yeah, and... and- it also comes down to how you're fighting that fish, too. I mean, if you <laughs> let that fish spool you, in most situations... It's your fault. It's your fault. Or your guide. Yeah. I mean, you know, tarpon guides. Yeah. They often say you need, you know, 350 yards of backing on a tarpon reel. It's like, dude, if I need 350 yards of backing on a tarpon reel, you're not doing your job. <laughs> That's right. Put the engine down, start the motor, and you go after it. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it comes down to how you fight it, too. That's such a big yeah, thing. Yeah. Well, you, you talked a little bit uh, about drag materials, and you mentioned those oil, old oil-impregnated kind of open-faced cork yep. drag systems that forever were the standards, back of the old Seamasters and the original Billy Pates and a lot of these, even the early Abels, big kind of open-faced oil-impregnated cork drag systems. Talk to us a little bit about how that has evolved new materials, kind of where we've come from those early days of, the, of that cork. So um, the automotive industry was using cork in car clutches. That was your slip material for the clutch. And they stopped using that in the late 50s or something like that. Yet that's where the dr- cork drag came from for these fly guys. And so they used cork as a drag material, even though the auto industry went to carbon fiber or they went to some other stuff first and then they ended up with carbon fiber. But cork was the big game drag material and it was the only big game drag material that any serious big game guy could use. There's no, I mean, there was really no alternative. The Ross big game was never really a big game reel because the serious guys didn't take it. Yeah. Your buddy in Montrose would fly down to the Keys and fish the big game, and he would do okay. You can catch your tarpon with it. But if you really wanted to have, you know, tippet protection, you had to lube that cork reel before your trips and do all that and take care of them. And it was just, it was a known. If you make a big game reel, it has to be a cork track. There was no alternative. And I knew that cork was a real shitty drag material, especially since the automotive industry stopped it in the 50s. So we said, man, Carbon fiber is the best drag material. And Sage was using carbon fiber. Jack Charlton used carbon fiber in his reel. And that's what it was. They were superior drag materials. And the issue with with carbon fiber is Jack Charlton told me we talked many times and we talked on the phone and about drag builds. He actually bought one of our reels. He said, Kristen, you know, I went into the store the other day and I bought a reel of yours. I said, why would you buy my reel? Just call me. I'll send you one. And he said, you know, on my mantle, I have the best reels and yours is one of them on my shelf. 
I thought that was pretty badass. That's that's high praise coming from Jack Charlton. So what, he was what, a, a yeah. shaman of of real that's design. Right. And yeah. so uh, Jack Charlton said that the biggest issue with with uh, carbon fiber in a reel like Sage had, which is a stack design that you'll see in many reels, they have you know washer upon washer and steel or aluminum rubbing between the washers, is heat buildup. And so if you if you want to be a scientist. Yeah, it's going to make your drag go up because as you create friction with carbon fiber, you're going to heat up that steel. That steel will expand, which increases your drag pressure. And when you've got four or five steel plates, that expansion gets so big that it ends up uh, uh, taking your drag pressure from four pounds to 4.2 pounds maybe. But the perception of the public was that your drag was going to be at four and it suddenly was going to jump up to seven, right? That's not the case. Uh, you know, if you spool that thing at a thousand RPM, yeah, it's going to expand, but steel can only expand so much. So it's it's not as dramatic as as people thought it was. But what we did, we said, okay, we want to use carbon fiber, but there's no way in hell we're going to convince the big game guys to use this reel unless it's cork. So I said, all right, let's make it cork and carbon fiber. You did a combo. So we just put a blade of a laser cut disc of cork bake the carbon fiber on top of that and and use it as an insulation material because the real issue with with carbon fiber is it will heat up so much that it will drain the oil out of your bearings on the reel and the reel will run dry and it'll end up ruining your bearings so you have to have a place that takes that insulates the bearings from the heat and so we put the cork in even though the epoxy base that the carbon fiber sits on already insulates it but we said we gotta have cork and that's 100% the truth why we have cork in our reels. Yeah, it's also, so we got two things. Cork was forgiving and it was heat insulating. So when you adjust it and it comes back to its natural state and all that, those were, those were all the benefits of cork that they were talking about at the time. So we had all that in our reels. And that's what put us on the map because we said, hey, it's got cork, but it's got even better on top. Yeah, you, you created the hybrid. Yeah. And, and honestly, the cork today serves no function as it is, but people demand it. And so we're moving, slowly moving away from it. But but it's because our, our design, uh, our reels are designed to be massive heat sinks. And if you look on our website, there's a video of an NV1112 uh, that we put in the freezer and we pull it out and it gets all this frost on it. And we put it on a line winder against the drag and you can see the heat First, the screw cap that holds the spool in, the frost melts off, and then you can see it go through the arms out into the spool, and the spool is just a massive heat sink, and it picks it all up and it dissipates it. And so those NVs, you can put them on, on, on a line winder and crank them on high drag, and they'll flatten out at 110 degrees. So that brings up a question. Is there any sort of like industry standard or IGFA standard regarding drag settings or the strength of a drag or specs with regard to fly reels. I know that I'm, I'm a huge reel junkie. I've got dozens and dozens of different reels from different manufacturers, some old, some newer, but you know, when you crank a reel down, which may be only applicable in certain species like, you know, GTs yep. or huge aeropime or something that's just absolutely going to give you the business on an yep. 11 or 12 weight. Um, some reels can literally lock down on those big animals yeah. and others you're slowing them down, but they're still kind of having their way with you. Is there any kind of standard that uh, goes across the boards on this? So there's no, there's no real standard, but uh, you know, I had a guy call and say, Hey man, your NV monster didn't stop the GT from running off the reef edge. And I said, the only thing that'll stop a GT from running off the D, the, the reef edge is if the, GT gets to the edge of reef and says, I don't want to go down there. No matter how much drag you have, it's going to go. But yeah, more drag is better. But the limiting factor on that, so there's no standard, but the limiting factor on the drag is the mechanism that engages, that holds that plate steady and that that doesn't break. And so you have to have either a Paul system like T-Bores and Ables have had, um, where that engages a tooth on a gear and, and it stops it from moving backwards and the spool spins against it. Uh, that has to be very, very strong if you can apply much more pressure. 
Uh, if you apply less pressure, then you don't need as strong a, a, a unit there. And then there's one-way clutches, which is a bearing that locks in one way and f uh, spins freely the other way. So the one-way clutches, uh, you really have to have the best of the best to be able to handle higher pressures. And we've got uh, right now, so we use on all our reels from the uh, X reel to the GTX, which is our biggest, strongest reel. And throughout all of them, we use a Japanese one-way clutch. And it's one of the few parts we import. And with the GTX, we are at the very limit of what this clutch can do. And it's pretty crazy to operate on the limit. Because I really think that's pretty much the limit of, of, of where we can comfortably, you know, produce a product uh, without fear of failure. And... You know, we could put in a stronger clutch if we wanted to get more drag, but you can't hold a rod at 25 pounds of drag for an extended amount of time. It's impossible. It's impossible. Well, we talked a little bit about these drag materials. We talked about you know, sealed drag mechanisms, um, the large arbor design that came out in the early 90s. What are some of the... Uh, you know, I guess what's the next big innovation that's going to come out in reels? Do we know what that is yet? Are we done? Have we done, you know, everything that we can? Have we seen everything that real manufacturers can put out there? Or is there kind of a, the next big thing or a, a breakthrough in design and innovation that we might be able to expect in the years ahead? I'd really like to put a bottle opener on a reel. <laughs> I've always wanted a bottle opener on my drag knob. Just pop. Well, there you go. Now we, now we know what to look for from Nautilus in the near future. I mean, I can tell you, you know, we uh, there, there's a lot of thinking, but there's also a lot of tinkering of useless stuff that we would think would be cool. And and but I think as far as you know, drag design goes, uh, it's hard to improve on things. You know, I look at like Jack Charlton's reels, and now they're called Mako reels. You know, it's it's such a complex design, and I've always said. Uh, the two best engineer reels out there are Charlton's and Loops. But if anything goes wrong, it's gone. And there's nothing, and, and they're not really, they're so complex that you cannot commercially scale it to the level where you'd want to be in my world. So, you know, I've, I've looked at them and, uh, you know, I saw Jack Charlton walk me through front to back on his reel and, you know, he told me about the issues he had, and I tell him about the issues I had, and he solved problems for me, and I answered questions for him. You know, so it was, it was, you know, it was really cool having, you know, being able to know that guy, and he was definitely a wizard, but you know, it's just hard to scale that level of intricacy, you know, the, the complexity of the assembly of that reel on, on a massive scale. It's really hard, and, and do it for less than you know thirty five hundred dollars. <laughs> But that's okay. I mean, yeah. there's a place for that, right? Yeah. I mean, when we came out with the with the GTX, everybody freaked out and said, "What's thirteen hundred bucks? Are you crazy?" And I said, "Man, you know, not everyone's going to buy a thirteen hundred dollar reel, and I can't, you know, I I can't afford to make five hundred reels and then that's it. You know, I'm never going to get my money back. So if I sold that for nine hundred bucks, I'd have to sell a thousand of them. I might, you know, I'll sell a thousand of them, but I'm not making any money on them." So I need to get, you know, 1300 bucks and work in the fact that I'm going to not sell so many as I would the Silver King that was at the time 700 bucks. So I think I, it's, it, well, it's an interesting formula that I think a lot of people don't take into consideration with regard to real design and, and what goes into it. I mean, they're complex, you know, so, entities. For so sure. I'll tell you one, one, one thing that sets us apart and from not everyone, but from a lot of the real manufacturers uh, you know, we machine everything in house. Uh, like I told you before, some of the parts we farm out to other machine shops in the U.S. just for volume sake, right? For capacity sake. But um, when we design a reel, we design to manufacture, and it's really, really easy to make a reel that looks cool, a spool cutout that looks cool. One of the most challenging things is making it look cool and differentiate it from the competition. You have to be able to get on the water and see that it's a Nautilus reel. And, you know, it's always a challenge that we run into when we see a reel that looks like ours. And it happens, you know, over and over and over. 
But um, I got sidetracked here now again. No, that's all right. What was the question? (laughs) Well, no, I mean, we were basically uh, talking about innovations. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and, and is there anything that's still out there? So I'm 100% sure. There's materials out there, and we're constantly looking at stuff, and we're constantly learning. I mean, like I told you, that food-grade bushing, uh, that – Whole, the, the, it, it's what the shaft on the X rails runs on those bushings. And I had, after what, eight years of the X rail or something like that, I've had the first time where a guy called and said, Hey, when I take it out in cold water, the, the reel gets tight. And when I put it in, when it gets above 32 degrees, it's loose again. And I said, It's impossible because that thermoplastic is impossible, it does not expand. It, it's, it does not take on water. There's nothing that can happen. And actually took that reel back, sent him a new one. He's never had a problem. And I had that thing vacuum sealed and I sent it to the manufacturer in Germany and I'm waiting to hear back from, you know, their tech team to say what's made this thing get tight, expand somehow. And what will make it tight is oils or petroleum, but it's inside. So even if you oil down your reel, it's not going to get on there, but, uh, if that wasn't the case on this one. So it's like we're always looking for new stuff. And that's how we got onto those little bushings. And, uh, you know, you can't stop looking. And I think that's where we win. When we went from the FWX reel, that was our strongest selling trout reel ever, uh, went on to the X reel that then blew up. I figured out a way to make these reels where I could make five X reels for every one. FWX I made. And I said, okay, I can make hay on this, right? But hey, how about we just take some of this money and put in, you know, bigger drag, bigger drag knob, all the stuff that costs more money that's going to make this a much better reel. And more user friendly. More user friendly. And so we ended up with a far superior product that hit the market at exactly the same price as the other one, but it's newer, better, stronger, lighter. So we're always looking for that envelope. That always innovating. Always. Well, in my opinion, I got to tell you, Nautilus has one of the best marketing taglines of all time in this industry. And that is the, the tested on animals label that you put on your yeah. reels. It's so good. So, so that came, it's a funny story. It came from a uh, buddy of ours who called, called me one time. He said, hey, Chris, man, you should, how about you say tested on animals? This is a guy that does marketing for AT&T and the, the, I mean, big companies. And he goes, man, how about testing on animal? I said, no, oh, I can't do that, man. That's way too rough. <laughs> and I don't know, six months to a year passed. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do that tested on animals thing. So I applied for a trademark and we launched it. We made it like a stamp. I thought of that cargo stamp on the Men at Work album. You remember that box on the beach? <laughs> now we're cargo dating stamp. ourselves right there here, Men go. at Work. <laughs> but anyway, so that, that was the stamp. I said, I just want to have like a stamp that says tested on animals. And I thought it was great. But the problem I had was I didn't remember who told me. So we launched this, and a year later, my buddy calls you. Goes, dude, use my tagline, man. I'm like, okay, I've got an envelope that I sealed when I started this, where it says, "Hey, dear buddy, I don't remember who did this, but anything you ever need, just let me know." And so he'll still call me and pick up, you know, say, "Hey, man, can I get a reel for this trip? I'm going on shore." So it's, it was funny. It was pretty embarrassing, but at least I'd sealed the stuff in the envelope and I sent it to him. I thought it was great. And, and I was actually kind of surprised. I'm like, how did it take so long for a company to come up with that? Because everything we do when we talk about, you know, big fish and, you know, what an crazy animal. water, they're animals, right? Yeah. And, and tested on animals. That's the, the biggest uh, and kind I, of statement piece you could make. I thought I wasn't going to be able to get the trademark. And when I went into the trademark office and I looked, I was like, oh my God, I can apply for it. And then I got it. I was like, oh. Well, it's sure. been great. It's taken off. I mean, it's, people seem yeah. to love that. They'd love it. Yeah. And it says it all. Because that's what we it want. Does. We want something that's, that's been tested on big species and yeah. big, you know, creatures that are going to put our gear to the absolute hey, biggest and, stress and, test and, out there. And a big trout is a big fish. It's a big animal. Yeah. Yeah. A big brown trout's a big animal. Yeah. A tarpon, big animal. I yeah. mean, that's awesome. Well, here's another industry specific question and one having to do with distribution. It seems that lately a lot of manufacturers and including I think more and more real makers lately are, are starting to sell direct to consumer and you're still selling, Nautilus is still selling only through specialty fly shops and retailers, correct? That's correct. And 
any future plans to move into direct sales or what are your thoughts and kind of philosophies on that? So here's my thought on that. And I get this question from inside industry people, uh, from people that are close to the industry and from friends all the time. Man, you should sell direct. You'll make a lot more money. I say, one, I sell direct. I have to get a whole new crew to deal with the phone calls, the weekend warriors, everything, the returns. Uh, God, I bought this from you and it does not work. And I get calls now that says, I bought this directly from you. It's like, no, you didn't because we never sell direct. But so I just gave a talk on this a couple of days ago. And the direct to consumer move from these manufacturer is a kick in the face to these fly shops there. It was the hand that fed them and they can all write letters to every little fly shop and thank them for helping them become who they are today. Granted, it's done with the management they had, the plans they did, the product they produced. Yes. But ultimately, the guy that put in the consumer's hands and told them this is the best product was the guy that made you who you are today. So that's one. Two, our sport, if you can't go to a shop and talk to the guy, I mean, you go to Orvis in Manhattan, they're consumer direct, but Orvis does more for to bring in new fly fishers than any other company in our in our industry. And you go into that fly shop and they will be on a chalkboard, the flow on the river, what's hatching on the river. There's, I mean, it, you know what to do. It's in the fly shop. You can walk into a fly shop and ask for knowledge. Today, I went trout fishing. I went, you know, was in with, with Jamie Anderson, or George Anderson's uh, Yellowstone angler. And I said, hey, man, what are we going to be fishing today? And he picked up five flies. Yeah, you got another seven that are great in that box. That's all you need, and I've got some more. And we went fishing. But the knowledge they give you, they help you. Hey, what gear should I buy? Right? What gear? I'm going to the Seychelles. I want to catch a GT. What reel should I buy? You talk to your fly shop. You can talk to your travel agent who's got a gear list. But where did that come from? It came from fly shops because they went to the fly shop to buy it. And the fly shop corroborated what you're telling them. Yeah, this is a great reel. Get this. And so... Where this gets complicated is looking in the future, right? And talked to a, a friend a little while ago about this. And, and one of the things that we, we got into was the fact that in the next 10 or so years, a lot of these shops will disappear. And if you don't have a strong web presence, you're going to struggle unless you have a phenomenal fly shop in a metropolitan area or a small shop and a destination. That's right. Where you have a season where everyone exactly. comes in. So you're going to come right back up. to being open from March to sept end of September, beginning of October in the Rockies, right? And in Florida, it's going to be from, uh, you know, January through or December through, you know, end of June, right? And that's what's going to happen to these shops. They're going to have to, you know, sell more T-shirts and become tourists or ski shops, whatever it is. Uh, and then there's going to be the other guys that have a super strong web presence because people like to click and buy. But the guys that are really going to win is the guy that has a super strong web presence that competes with these direct-to-consumer guys and is not afraid of the direct-to-consumer guy. And then he's got a kick-ass shop. That store is going to become like what Cabela's was back in the day when if you were within eight hours of the Cabela's store in Nebraska – you made a detour on your way home because you wanted to go to that store because it was something to see. You, you know, you're so spot on. I've said so many times on this program and throughout all my years in the industry, you know, we are a sport that has to have the specialty retailer. We have to have it. It's too complex and complicated of a sport. And yeah, you know, YouTube videos and stuff you find online now, it certainly helps that the, the the access to information and knowledge is, is stronger than it's ever been before, but we are still a technical, complicated sport where conditions are changing all the time. And as a manufacturer, and, and certainly as a travel agent with what we do at Yellow Dog, that specialty shop is so key to maintaining and growing that consumer base because it, this is a hard sport. And unless you have people that can feed you that knowledge and really help you grow, you know, kind of your fly fishing journey, you're going to be in serious trouble. And, and, you know, we are, I think you're unfortunately right that in the years ahead, we are going to see 
the number of specialty fly shops continue to decrease, but the ones that are doing it right are going to thrive and there's always going to be a place for them. We're a sport that needs it. And as a manufacturer, as a service provider, we've got to hope that these shops stay there. So I'll, I'll give you the perfect example. You can go online now and buy flies for a dollar on multiple websites. Yeah. Are they going to hold up? You know, probably not. Okay. Um, if you go in a fly shop and you buy the flies, the same flies, yeah. you're going to pay three fifty dollars for them. Yeah. Are they going to hold up? Probably not over time. I mean, over flies, time, yeah. no, but it's yeah. going to be a better tie. Oh, for sure. Than the $1 online. Yeah, because they're putting their name on it and they're staking their reputation on and it. And because they yeah. realize that this brand fly yeah. is not tied as well as that one. Yeah. And you will see common patterns like a Prince nymph yeah. that a fly shop will buy from one manufacturer as opposed to the other manufacturer. Because he considers it to be better. And that's not that insider knowledge thing. that that shop has. You're not going right? to find that online? No. You can't replicate that. You're going to have to listen to the, the, the manufacturer. Yeah. But another one. So today we were fishing and Tim Harden, who runs our social media, you know yeah. him well. Yeah. He came out with us. Venturing and, angler. Yeah, yeah. And he had forgotten his reel. So he stopped by George Anderson on the way to the river and said, hey, can I borrow a reel? And they gave him a loaner. And when he shows up at the river, he goes, dude, look at this thing. And I look at it, I said, man, it's not even anodized. And I said, Jamie, where's this from? And he goes, oh, that was one of the prototypes you sent us. You remember it was pinching the line. Oh, it was one of yours, but it was, it was a one of mine. super early generation. We hadn't even anodized the X-Reel. And we sent it out to some shops. And they pointed out, hey, man, it's grabbing, it's pinching the fly line on this corner. And yeah, a fishing guy could tell you that, but it all depends on casting style too, because it didn't happen to me. And I fished the crap out of it. But I reel right and I pull left and that's away from the spool. But the guy that reels left and he pulls off the line, he's pulling it into the spool. And where the frame met the spool, it was nicking that fly line. And he was like, that's one of the prototypes you sent us. And that's why you change it to this. And he showed Tim because you see the new ones, the ones that were mass produced had this, this curve instead of that edge. So, I mean, that's a fly shop. They're working for us. They're that's helping right. us. Yeah. Yeah. Tested on animals and tested on anglers. There right you there. go. Yeah. I love it. Well, let me change gears a little bit. So yeah. recently back in July of 2020, Nautilus Reels was honored um, by President Trump at the White House as part of the Spirit of America Showcase, an event that celebrated, I think it was eight small businesses, highlighted innovative products that were all made in the U.S., uh, quite an honor for Nautilus to receive this recognition and be amongst a small group of only eight companies. Tell us about that kind of whole event and, and that award and what that meant to you. So uh, I walk into the office one day and Charlotte goes, hey, there's a girl from the White House on the phone. And I said, is that a girl from the White House on the phone? <laughs> and she said, yeah, Mike hung up on her earlier and she just called back and I've got her on hold. I think it's the real deal, Kristen. She says she's going to send an email. And I picked up the phone and I talked to this girl, Alexandra, and talked to her for a little while and sounded legitimate. And I was like, where's the catch here? And uh, then we got the email. And it came from the White House. We're like, oh, yeah, this for real. You click on the who it's from and it's it actually says whitehouse.gov. And you're like, oh, my God, this is real. We're invited to go to the White House. And we told no one. And they said, you can bring two people. And I brought uh, Charlotte, who runs our shop. She's my right hand and half of my left hand, really. But um, it was her and I that went to the to the White House. We said, we told no one because we figured, plus the pandemic, you know, that could be shut down any time. And it was right in the BLM movement thing in D.C. I mean, it was pretty depressive to show up in D.C. The hotels were empty. Uh, you know, there were fences everywhere. All the national monuments were fenced in, like three rows. It was pretty depressive. But uh, we sent a bio out to the White House. And in the bio, I said, well, you know what? If we're going to go to this, um, we need to make our, our, our voice heard. And so in the bio, as part of our bio, we wrote that uh, we were big, you know, we fought for the environment and that we were big supporters of Captains for Clean Water and the No Pebble Mine movement. This was before uh, he, he, he signed off on canceling. The yeah, Pebble I, I want to ask you about that timing for sure. So, but you guys made a statement when I, you showed up. We made a statement. So it was in our bio. I thought it was going to fly. 
You're like, there's no way they're going to approve this. They're going to rescind the invitation. So, so we went there yeah. and we brought a no pebble mine reel and we brought a captains for clean water reel. And, and then we made a special reel for, uh, the president, which they put in, I think the presidential library or something that we had a laser etched white house on it. Yeah. Red, and the red and blue reel. Super yeah, cool. Red, blue, red, white, and blue. Yeah. Reels. And, uh, it was pretty impressive. I mean, it's an honor. You're invited to this institution that's made this country, right? Yeah. That still controls the country, yeah, right? The, or the less, man changes, control. but the institution never does. Exactly. And so yeah. uh, the one question I had was, how did they find us? Because we're there, and across from us is Weber Grills. I'm like, oh, my God, that's a monster. And then there was another guy. It was super interesting. The largest manufacturer of base oils, base lotions, in the States and it's a young crew and they make all the base lotions for all these super lotion brands, the cosmetics, all the cosmetics. Yeah. So your wife's $300 face cream probably buys the base lotion for them. Add salt and, and they're us made. French. They're us made. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's really, really cool. Like Cause that stuff. was what all eight of these companies had in common. They were all U S manufactured it was products, U S manufactured. And so I did not know where it came from. I thought it was from a guy that fishes Donald Trump jr. And I thought that that must've, uh, you know, maybe he told him, Oh yeah, get those guys. And, uh, the guy that called him and he called Donald jr. He said, I didn't know there was an event going on. So I was like, all right, where did they get this from? So this Alexandra shows up and, She's second generation Norwegian here in the States. And I was like, oh my God. She's the one that worked at the White House. She worked at the White House. She was the one that called us. And I said, well, how did you, f why were we selected? And she goes, you know, we've had our eyes on you for a while now. Uh, what we really look for, and she goes, it's on Google. And she goes, what we look for is the companies that make their stuff in the U.S. and best advertised and capitalize on the fact that they're made in the U.S. And I thought that was a pat on the back. That's huge. So that, was, that was really cool. Well, I, I got to ask you, you know, so in the conservation and outdoor industry, um, Trump is not necessarily loved by everyone. I think not at that. all. And, and at any time, anytime Trump is associated with, with really anything having to do with outdoor recreation or outdoor products, you're going to hear from people about this, right? People are going to make some noise. Yes. Did you guys get any shit as a result of the, of the 2020 white house event? Did anybody, you know, give you a hard time about the fact that it was Trump in the white house? You're thinking like, this is a really cool award regardless of who's there. I mean, that was the first thing we have to detach from any affiliation because I think our customer base is 50, 50 and I don't want to piss off anybody. And I want to put an emphasis you're, on these. You're a nonpartisan real manufacturer, yeah. right? You're That's like, right. Hey, we're just selling product and trying to make it the best. That's right. And, and so, um, I spent about 10 days back and forth with Tim going over a press release because word was out now. We weren't even going to say anything. Word was out. People heard about it. And so we said, all right, we need to say something here because otherwise we're just going to get like haters and lovers and it's going to be a nightmare. And we worded that press release so carefully, emphasized on the fact that we had been invited and chose to voice our our concerns for the environment, uh, raise awareness at the White House by going. Uh, rather than go there, like all the others, you know, that were there, that I don't think they brought a, 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 a cause with them, you know? And I thought it was a great moment to speak out about it. And I know for a fact that he saw that and he was aware of that because we were told that when he when he was going to step in 20 minutes before, he was going to read the eight bios. And then he went from manufacturer to manufacturer, walked around the room and uh, talked to him and he asked questions. And what was most amazing to me, I said, man, this guy's got to be taking Adderall in this position because he was so sharp. He picked out questions from this bio that I'd written and asked questions about stuff that we'd written. He didn't touch on the conservation part, but he asked questions about manufacturing and all that. That came straight out of our bio, and he wanted to know more about it, essentially. And it was incredible that that guy, and you know, we were the last company he interviewed or he, he spoke to. And so for that guy to remember that after he's got 20 minutes to look over eight companies was pretty impressive. Well, you know, I think what made it super impressive from – the industry standpoint, Kristen, is that, you know, you guys 
have a track record of being outspoken about environmental issues, right? Things that matter to our sport. And you showed up with a captains for clean water reel, a no pebble mine reel. Um, it was a hell of an opportunity to really bring these concerns that matter to our sport and certainly to our industry to the White House. And I love it. And, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this was the reason it happened, but let's just throw that out here theoretically, right? This event was in J, uh, July of 2020. July 9th, right? yes. And then in November of 2020, less than four months after the White House event, at a point when it appeared all but certain that, that Pebble Mine and the permit was going to be granted, the Trump administration shocked everyone by denying the mine permit. And and so I was thinking today, it's like, well, maybe that that no pebble mine Nautilus reel that may have been sitting on, on Trump's desk had something to do with that decision. So, you know, you can at least think about that, which would be kind of cool. So I thought about that a lot and and actually wrote. So, so when we did that post, uh, it was very delicately uh, phrased, that post, because we didn't want to like the picture of. The President Trump with the reel was the last picture in the slideshow of pictures on our on our Instagram posts, Facebook posts. And you probably got all kinds of comments. We got all kinds of comments, but yeah. the cool thing was that we would have a comment and then the guy would reply to his own comment and say, oh, hold on, I read the bio, bravo. And so that was very cool. I mean, we really thought this one out and, and it was, it, we had to get the message across that, that, hey, this is not a political statement. And we're not thumping chests here and, and, and celebrating anything political here. We went up there. We're honored by this, you know, recognition from the White House. And we brought this cause up there. And, I, you know, I got calls from the Pebble Mine guys. I got calls from the Captains for Clean Water guys. They knew. They were the ones that knew that we were going, that we were bringing them up. And I was, I sent them, the, this is what's going on the buy. Are you good with that? Yes. So we really went up there prepared. And armed to the teeth, but I know that uh, you know some of the magazines reposted some of it and changed the wording on it, and they had a much bigger backlash than we ever could have had. But I think, you know, we might have had maybe you know less than five percent negative comments, which was pretty amazing because, like I said, we're fifty fifty. Well, and you know. It's one thing I've always loved about Nautilus. You guys have never been afraid to speak out and, and speak up for causes that matter. I mean, you've in a variety of things like earthquake relief in Haiti, stream access in Utah, obviously the pebble mine issue, the you know the water quality issues in Florida in your own backyard. Yeah. You know, I think in this day and age, so many companies and certainly in the, in the fly fishing industry are just timid. You know, they, they're walking on eggshells and God forbid you, you know, take a stand on anything and offend anyone. And, and some of the big ones too. Yeah. And, and I mean, big issues that matter, matter to our sport. And, and you're right. Absolutely. Some of the biggest companies are just kind of strangely silent on these things because they don't want to offend anybody, but we don't have that luxury in fly fishing of, of being silent. I mean, unless you're willing to speak out and, and kind of put your reputation and the reputation of your brand behind some of these issues that really do matter to our sport. You know, what are we doing here? You have to. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell you, you know, I'm, I might not side with Yvonne Chouinard of Patagonia on a lot of things, but I applaud the man for having the balls to put his mouth, uh, to put his money where his mouth is. Yeah, consistently. Consistently. And, and I think it's, I think it's great whether I agree with him or not. This is what I think. You don't like it. Don't buy my product. And I think that's, I mean, that's worthy of a big applause. I couldn't agree more. And I, I hope more manufacturers, more businesses in fly fishing continue to step up on that yep. level. Our, our sport needs it. The future of our sport That's depends right. on it. That's right. And if you don't want to step up, at least help out and, you know, but, but the biggest thing you can do, it's not the thousand dollar check, the $5,000 check. It's speaking out. It's telling your supporters, your clients, Hey man, this matters. This matters. Pay attention. Go over here and check it out. Yeah. I send even whenever we have to have to sign pebble mine documents. I forward it to my entire contact list, out of which 90% are not in the fly fishing industry. And most or all my friends go sign these things. They have no clue what it is. But they say, if Kristen wants me to support this, it's got to be good. Let's sign. It matters. It, it makes matters. a difference. Yeah. Well, kudos for doing that. And don't stop. We Thank need you. more of that in our industry. Thank for you. For sure. I hope more companies get on the uh, on the program. With yeah, that. well, you guys do. So that's well, great. 
It matters. Yes, it, it does. does. Yeah. Well, tell me, Kristen, what, what's next for Nautilus? Uh, any big introductions or plans or projects in the near future? So we just announced the cessation of production of uh, the NV, NVG series. So the NV was launched in 2016. No, 2006. So you're looking at a reel that's going to be, uh, what, six to yeah, seven, 16, 16 years, years old. Yeah. So 16 years ago, we did the NV. And, and a testament to our obsession with doing stuff right is that you can buy a spool today and put it on the reel that you bought in 2006, and it'll fit. And it's a great reel. It's our, uh, the biggest contributor to the bottom line for us still. But it's holding up production, and I need more production time, and I could improve it. I think if I just change the drag knob on that reel, I'd have a whole new wave of people loving it, and it would make us a lot of money, but at the expense of not making as many reels of the other ones that the people demand. I mean, our, our, our fly shops never get enough reels, and we have you know f- figured out many new ways of making stuff, like the X-reel, where I can... You know, in, in two operations, I make 24 frames. As opposed to the FWX, it was five operations to make one frame. So um, we're going to launch a new reel series, and they'll start trickling out, and, you know, towards the middle end of this year. And, you know, throughout the next year, we'll be filling in the whole line. So it's going to be fun. Looking well, forward. Exciting to times ahead. And, I, and I'm, I'm guessing the next two to three years in, in the world of fly fishing are going to be a bit busy. So... They will be. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the world is reopened and people are hungry to get back on the water. We yes, love sir. it. Absolutely. Well, last question. Any big trips or adventures coming up for you? I know you've been out here this week fishing in Montana and Idaho. What's next? May 19th. How many days is that? It's uh, two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. I'm heading to Iceland there you go. for the fifth time now to go fish for big brown trout in the lake. My so favorite incredible. fish in the world is a brown yeah. trout. Yeah. And... Uh, it's the third year that I'm going where I swore it was the last year. So maybe this is the last year, but I said that three years before that too. So yeah, good luck with that. (laughs) It's great. Well, that's good. Well, thanks so much for sitting down with us, Kristen. This has been awesome. Best of luck with the new factory and all that you have going on. Hey, thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Well, that's it for this latest episode of Waypoints, the podcast that is 100% dedicated to travel, adventure, and exploration. Be sure to visit yellowdogflyfishing.com to plan and research your next fishing trip. Sign up for newsletters and new podcasts and stay up to date on the latest travel news and developments. Join us for our next episode of Waypoints. And remember, life is short and no one ever regretted a life of adventure. This has been another episode of Waypoints the podcast of fly fishing travel and adventure angling. Waypoints is produced by Brian Gregson with music provided by the Steep Canyon Rangers. Visit yellowdogflyfishing.com for more destination profiles, travel news, and expert advice, and be sure to join us for our next episode.